Corinthians chapter 15. I really started, believe it or not, last week, even though we ended up in John chapter 6, that's where we spent the majority of our time. I was preaching, it came from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first part of it. I've not been able to get out of 1 Corinthians 15 for a while, and the next few times I preach, whenever that is, however often it is, it will be out of 1 Corinthians 15. So I want to start there today. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 and go from there. I don't know how much we'll get through today, but that's okay. I'm not in a hurry. And I'll make sure you guys are out to go and um, be blessed and enjoy time with your families today. It says, moreover, it's Paul speaking, brethren, brothers, I declare to you the gospel that I preach to you, which you also received and now you're standing in. What a wonderful blessing it is. You received the gospel preached. It's like Adam just spoke. By the way, what an awesome testimony. It'll be even greater when the Lord gives us a spiritual gift in the moment to understand the Spanish and the shrieks. Although we can do things on our own to help understand that as well. But what an awesome testimony when the word went forth that it was received and a woman stood on it and she was healed. Amen? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that why we exist to bring the kingdom of God to those who we come into contact with? I don't exist to go to heaven. That's the destination. That's not the goal. I will be there. I know it. If you're saved and believe Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that he died for you and you can't do what he did for your own self, you will be there as well. That is not the goal. That is our destination. The goal is to have the manifestation of the kingdom here on earth because that's God's will for that woman. Yes, praise God. That's amazing. And so for those of you who are looking for the opportunity to go down there and to bless our brothers and sisters in Honduras, it's coming. It's coming. And I'm excited, too, to see the pictures. We haven't had a chance to catch up because I know Pastor was busy this week with, with the wedding and other things that are going on. But I'm excited in what God is doing, not only here, but across the world. He goes on to say in verse 2, by which also you are saved. By saved by what? By the gospel that I preached and you stood in, that you are standing in. If you keep in memory what I preach, unless, if you don't remember it, you have believed in vain, which means this word vain is without success. You have unsuccessfully believed if you don't keep in memory what I have preached and stand on it. If you read 1 Corinthians 4, 15 here all the way through, I'm not going to today. There's, I don't know, 50 something verses, 58 verses. The word vain is used five or six times, and actually, four different words for the word vain are used. In other words, you've been given something, don't let it be in vain. The title of this message, if you take notes, is The Purpose of Grace. Grace has a purpose. Are we allowing grace to fulfill its purpose in our lives? That's where we're headed. I don't know if we'll get there. Sounded good during that moment. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, here's Paul speaking again, here's what I've delivered unto you. First of all, I delivered to you what I received. We cannot give out that we have not received. When you encounter the Lord Jesus Christ in, a, in an awesome moment of prayer or intercession or worship or through the word, that's not just for you to get glory fat on. It's for you to give. It's for you to give. We're not supposed to just eat it up and eat it up and just grow in ourselves, although we do that. It is to give. You are encountered by God to be an encounter to somebody else. Pastor gave the testimony when he was preaching the word in Mark 11, where we stand upon faith, if we speak through this mountain, if you believe that you receive. He's giving that word. He can't give that word if it's not in him to give, if he didn't receive it first. And likewise, that woman had to receive that word, and now she is required in herself, spiritually, to go and to testify of the goodness of God and what he has done of what she has received. When the man of the Gadarenes, who was a demoniac, who, who broke chains and was naked and running through the catacombs, this guy who came to him, and he wanted to go and be with Jesus, Jesus said, no, don't. You can't come with me, but go and tell all that I've done for you. He was required by Jesus to go and to spread what he had received from Jesus Christ himself. And the next time Jesus Christ came to that region, there was a mighty revival and outbreak and outpouring because of the testimony that went forth from this man being whole. Even though the people in that moment, now that the man was sane and fully clothed, we're scared and wanted Jesus to leave. In essence, it's nuts, but the world works backwards. Verse 3, that's where we were. Which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's talking about the Old Testament, the prophecies. Verse 4, and that he, Jesus, was buried and he rose again the third day according again to the prophets, the scriptures. That he was seen of Peter and then the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brothers all at once. 
of whom the greater part remain and are present, but some have fallen asleep. That doesn't mean they've left to Jesus. That means that they've died. After that, he was seen of James, then all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, one who was born out of due time. Paul had his miraculous encounter on the road to Damascus, right, with Jesus himself. So this is what Paul says in verse 3. This is what he preached. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 2, he says, I declare among you to know nothing save Christ and him crucified. That was Paul's gospel that he was preaching. He says in verse 3 that Jesus died for our sins. That's something you and I cannot do for ourselves. We can never be good enough on our own. Paul is saying that Jesus meets the demand of God in the law and the redemption required for man because they sin, and he pulls them together at the cross. And one of the greatest acts of grace and mercy ever given by God. He fulfills the law of God, the perfect demand of being righteous according to the law, which exposed sin. And he filled the necessary redemption through the sacrifice of his blood and the cross. This is Jesus. It says in Hebrews 2, 9, that Jesus, by God's grace, by the grace of God, in other words, it was God's idea that Jesus came and did this, tasted death for every man. I've looked up every in man. And it means every man. I don't believe in a gospel where God picks and chooses you can be saved. When Jesus tasted death for every man, that means he tasted death for you and me and those I've yet to talk to. Those who have passed on and those who will come. Every man. He transcended time in this. That's Hebrews 2.9. Verse 4 it says, as prophesied, Jesus rose from the dead. There's more than that to come. Once we get past, uh, I think, verse uh, 10 or 11 here in 1 Corinthians 15, the rest of the chapter speaks of the resurrection for the most part, and it is awesome. And I want to go into that probably the rest of the year whenever I preach. We'll get there. That's not today, though. Verse 5 through 8, we, I spoke about this last week, we don't have a blind faith. It says that Jesus, after he resurrected, was seen of Peter, the disciples, above 500 at one time, James, the apostles, and Paul himself. We don't have a blind faith. I spoke about it last week. Blind faith is believing that somehow, right, non-life bore life. Well, how did that happen? I don't know. Well, do you agree that life comes from life? Yes, life has to come from life. Well, how did life begin? Well, at some point it had to come from non-life. Okay, that doesn't make sense to me. That's blind faith. I don't have that. You don't have that. Within the lifetime of the witnesses spoken of here in 1 Corinthians 15, accounts of Jesus began to be written. No one in the ancient world denied or questioned the existence of Jesus, not like some do today. The rabbis of the ancient world, they did not deny the existence of Jesus. However, they denounced him as the illegitimate child of Mary and a sorcerer. Because remember, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. The pagans of the ancient world, the Romans at the time, they did not deny Jesus existed or that he was, but they dismissed him as a peasant scoundrel who just made a commotion. A push exists today that Jesus wasn't a real historical person, but that he was, he's an idea or an hypothesis to follow or to, to try to be like. And the crazy thing about this is the two most prominent historians who are fighting this idea that Jesus didn't exist, that he wasn't a historical figure, are both atheists. Because they believe the historical record and the historical account. Letters and accounts of Jesus' life began 25 to 40 years after his resurrection, the first being the epistles of Paul. So only 25 to 40 years after Jesus resurrected, he's ascended by this point, obviously, accounts began to be written, historical accounts that still exist today. Again, we don't have a blind faith. He was seen by all these witnesses, over 500 of them. And so these accounts started to come out of Jesus. For example, King Arthur. Many people believe that he was a real person. You know that King Arthur is never mentioned by name in any historical document? And the first accounts of his life came out 300 to 400 years after his death. That's a lot longer time to get the facts wrong, right? But Jesus, here we are within a generation, the same generation of which he died and rose again. They're already producing accounts of his works. Again, what am I saying? I'm saying we don't have a blind faith. We have a faith in the one who was, who is, and is yet to come. And he walked this earth and he walked it for you and I. 
Josephus, he was a Jewish historian. He was not a Christian, not a believer in Christ. 40 years, no, 60 years after Jesus' death, or after his resurrection, he was the first non-Christian to mention Jesus in his writing. And he said it this way. He said, James, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ. That's the first account we have of a non-Christian speaking of Jesus' existence. And then there's these historians who were Romans. They were pagans. In other words, they did not believe in Christ either. They were named Pliny and Tacitus, 80 years after Christ. So still within the generation of his resurrection. They were Romans who recorded the tenure of Pilate and the Roman Emperor Tiberius during the time of Jesus Christ. And both of them wrote and recorded the execution of Jesus. So again, we don't have a blind faith. We have a faith in the one who is real. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he goes, Paul goes on to say, I, here's Paul's humility coming out, right? I am the least of these apostles, that I am not meet. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. In verse 10, he says, but by God's grace, I am what I am today. What a wonderful line. By God's grace, I am what I am today. In verse 9, he says he's not worthy to be called an apostle because of the things in his past. You know, if Paul was disqualified for the things in his path, path to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so are we. We all have the same past. We all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And those wages of sin, what we earn from that sin is death. You and I, that's what we earn. But Jesus came. He says, but God's grace has made me who I am. Maybe you don't really like who you are. I tell you what, if you dig deep enough, you'll find some ugly motives. This is encouraging. This is why our church is growing leaps and bounds. I know. (laughs) But it's truth. If we look into who we truly are, what does it say? It says the heart's deceitful, blah, blah, blah. And here's the problem. We're looking into a false identity if we've come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Who do you really know when you start looking in yourself? Are you looking into the old man or the new man? You know, Paul says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because of my past. But Paul knew the grace of Jesus Christ. So he has this qualifying statement. We are all too familiar with our past, and we allow the devil to use it to beat us up. Maybe your past is just yesterday. Maybe your, maybe your, I don't know. I mean, well, obviously your past is yesterday. That's literally the definition of the word past. Not that definitions of words means anything more these days, but that's okay. But your past is covered by the blood of Jesus. Your past is gone because grace has been extended to you through Jesus Christ and his cross, his death, and his resurrection. That's what Paul is saying. By God's grace, I am what I am today. I'm not the one who persecuted the church of God anymore. Instead, I stand righteous in Jesus Christ. I stand now with my life hid in God through Christ Jesus. This is what he's speaking to right here in this moment. So who do you know? Do you know your old man? It says in Colossians chapter 3 that the deeds of the old man... Or fornication and uncleanness. The the old man has vile passions and and evil desires. Idolatry, anger, wrath, malice. The old man's a liar and blasphemous. This guy, the old man, deserves God's wrath. And it says, for these things, the wrath of God will come. For those who don't repent, who don't receive Jesus Christ. What is there to like about the old man? If Paul dwelt on what he used to do before he knew Jesus Christ, he never would have preached the gospel. He would have lived in an oh me, oh my state the rest of his life. He might have been saved, might have gone to heaven, might have loved the Lord and known he was loved, but he wouldn't have gone out victoriously and preached the gospel fearlessly. What does it say? He, he gives an accolade to everything that happened to him. Beaten this many times, jailed this many times, close to death this many times, whipped this many times. And he goes on and on and on about it. He would not have had the boldness to stand up and preach the gospel and receive those sufferings like Christ received if he didn't know who he was in Christ Jesus, if he didn't know the new man, his true nature, by the grace of God, I am who I am. He knows that now, back to Colossians 3, he's renewed in the knowledge after the image of the one who created him. He knows he's purchased and equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He knows he is righteous. It means that he's right with God, and he's been made a carrier of his presence. His presence is in you and I now. Do we believe that? Adam didn't heal anybody on, in, in Honduras, and he'd be the first one to tell you that. But the presence of God, whom he's a carrier of, you and I are the ark of the new covenant. I think it's so funny when you see these historians looking for the ark on the earth. 
They're not going to find it unless they meet a Christian. Because I believe it's Revelation 22 that says the ark is in heaven. It's not here. Maybe it's Revelation 21. You and I are the ark that people need to encounter. So you and I can walk with our head held high, not in pride, but in confidence in who we are in Jesus Christ. If you're walking with your head down, it's because you are looking at your past and you are looking at the old man and his deeds. Stop. There's nothing there but death. There's nothing there but shame and condemnation. It says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because when we are in Christ Jesus, when we look back, we see the cross. When we look back, we see the resurrection. When we look back, we see all that Jesus Christ has done for us. What do you and I have over everybody else in the world who is not a Christian? This one thing. You and I are right in God's eyes. That's what righteous means. It means when God looks, looks at us, he sees what Jesus has done, and therefore we can relate to the Father again. No one else can on earth if they haven't received what Jesus Christ has done for them through grace. You just can't. You can't get there by works. Paul said, if I boast, let me boast in the Lord. We're not prideful. We know what we came from. We're thankful. You know, uh, the Mormon church if you ever get into a long discussion with them, it will come down to grace. I'm not trying to bash the other church. I'm not. Please hear my heart. But every other religion that is not Christianity that will give you a Bible will also give you something else to read. Right? And ultimately, because they give you something else to read, whether it's pamphlets or a different book, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. We have the word of God, and this is it. Don't follow the word of a man. Don't follow the word of a woman. Don't follow the word of somebody on social media without going to this and making sure it lines up with this. If somebody's giving you something else to read, yeah, but you'll get greater revelation here. Read this. Look, I love reading other books, but I'm not going to it for truth. It's nice to see the revelation that God has given to other people and that can help me understand the truth in the word, but I have to go back to the word of God always and at all times. And when I look at the word of God, we can see God's grace, Jesus extended to us. I mean, I preached this weeks ago about Jesus is the gift of grace given to us. It was God's idea. Again, he takes a death for every man and all of him is mine now if I receive it by faith. So I need to receive the life of Jesus now. What is the life of Jesus? Now, this is very simplistic, but it is the revelation of the Father. Jesus said, I only speak what God speaks. I only do what I see God doing. So when I receive the life of Jesus and I read it in his word, I get a revelation of my heavenly Father. The best way I can ever get a revelation of who God is is through the life of Jesus. And through his life, I can see how to walk with God in right relationship. That's his life. Do you receive that by faith today? Do you receive the baptism that Jesus offers? He says that he will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. That means what? It means that I can do what Jesus did. Jesus said that himself and greater things. How? Receiving by faith the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says I, I, God's grace is in Jesus is also his death. It says in Romans 6, 7, he who is dead is free from sin. Do you receive that today by faith? Well, I just sinned yesterday. Maybe, but you're still free from it. You don't have to, and when you do, you're doing what's contrary to your new nature because you're dead. Look, if there's a coffin right here, and there's a dead man in it right now, and I said, man, that is one ugly suit they put you in. How's he going to respond? He's not. He's dead. We give him life again when we go back and, and give him access, the old man, and do what is of our old nature. And we know what is our old nature. I just read the deeds in Colossians chapter 3, what they are, right? When we lie or when we're blasphemous or, you know, when we uh, covet other things or, or fornicate, whatever it may be. That's giving life to a man who's in a coffin. We, we shouldn't do that because that's not relying and depending on the grace of Jesus Christ. And what about Jesus' resurrection? It means that we have eternal life with him. Do you receive that by faith? Do you know where you're going? Do you know you're going to heaven if you died right now? I hope so. If not, today's the day to decide. Receive by faith the work of Jesus Christ. And 
his ascension, which means that you and I are seated with Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking, in authority and victory. Do you receive that by faith? Paul is saying, I am who I am by the grace of God. You are all these things by the grace of God. You and I, he says, by grace you have been saved through faith. We have to receive it through faith. In the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, it says it this way. But by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace, it's a chapter, or verse 10, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. And that word there, vain, means it was not without purpose. His grace he bestowed on me has a purpose. What is that purpose? Good question. I'm going to answer it in a minute. But I labored more abundantly than anybody else. There's his humility coming in play again, right? And he says, but not I. God's grace through me did the laboring. So you already see some of the purpose of grace. His grace that was with me. That word vanity not only means without purpose, but it also means empty. Can, we, can you and I, the original title of this was Don't Waste Grace. That sounded too negative, so I, I changed it to the purpose of grace. But we can waste grace. We can make it empty. We can make it vain and without purpose if we don't allow it to fill us for purpose, its purpose in our lives. So what is the purpose of grace? Paul says he labored more abundantly to fulfill this purpose in his life. I have four things, four things I believe um, are part of the purpose. It's more than this. If anybody ever just says, these are the four things, stop right there. God's greater than our bullet points. I'm just sharing with you four of the things. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm not the end all be all, I'm just saying. But salvation and righteousness, sanctification and wisdom. First Corinthians 1.30 says, Jesus has become these things to us. What does that mean? It means I'm already sanctified because Jesus is my sanctification. That, now listen, that is true positionally. Practically, I have to walk it out. Practically, sanctification or holiness is a walk. It, is, it, says, it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? It says fight the good fight of faith. I'm doing this over my own life. It says take every thought captive. This is the process of walking out what is already true of me in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? But that's offered in Jesus and what he's done is part of his grace. The life of Jesus can be made given in vain if I'm not doing anything with it. And I'm not fulfilling the purpose of why Jesus was given. The number one reason, this isn't one of the four, but I've already preached about it. It's not going to preach about it. The number one way we make grace in vain is when we don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the ultimate reason that he came. But here's the four points I want to give you. The first one is this. Grace's purpose, number one, is to empower us to not sin. I shared with you weeks ago, Titus 2.12, one of my favorite verses now in life. It says, the grace of God is teaching you to deny worldly lust and all ungodliness and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In this present world. That's what grace is empowering me to not sin. It's empowering you to not sin. Romans 6, 1-14. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to hit some highlights of it. In verse 1, I want to read verse 1, 4 and 14. I thought I'd do that for time's sake here. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he says this, Paul, What shall we say? So we continue in sin so that grace abounds. Grace abounds where sin is, but we should not continue to sin just because it does. And abounds means that grace overflows. How do we know sin is abounding? Because the law exposed sin. But grace overflows to us where sin is, where sin is exposed, where sin is identified. This is verse 1 here. In verse 4, Paul says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ Jesus was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you and I should walk in the newness of life. Because you and I are dead to sin through Christ, sinning is doing what's contrary to this newness of life. I have to become something I'm not to sin again. Does that make sense? Because if I'm walking in Christ Jesus, where he's put me in him, he's not going to sin. If I'm allowing his life, Paul says in Colossians 3, when Christ, who is my life, appears, I shall appear with him in glory, in likeness. 
If Christ is my life, he's become my life, he's not going to sin through me. So therefore, I have to do something contrary to my new life in order to sin. And we all do. But just understand, that's not who you are. That's not who you as a new creation are created to do. Right? 1 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21, we're an ambassador in Christ, minister of reconciliation. It says, Christ became sin for us who knew no sin. We are the righteousness, therefore, of God in Christ Jesus. If I'm right before God, I'm not sinning. I am right before God, therefore I don't have to sin. But thank God that the blood of Jesus exists to cleanse me from all unrighteousness when I do, when I confess my sin and I repent and turn away from it. Amen? Verse 14 in Romans 6. For sin shall not have dominion, rule over you. For you are not under law, but you are under grace. Now this has been misrepresented to have a lifestyle to do whatever you want to do. But if you read Romans 6 in the context, obviously I already showed you, just because grace exists, we shouldn't be sinning. Right? When we pick and choose, when we cherry pick scriptures, we end up with a screwed up life. Under grace, the gift of Jesus, I am raised with him out of the sin pit that I was once in. And he is inside me, empowering my life now to not sin. To not sin. Number two, we fulfill the purpose of grace when we use the gifts that he's given. In Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. It says, having then gifts, that's a variation of the word grace, by the way, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, which is serving, to ministering, or he that teaches, to teaching, or he that exhorts on exhortation, or he that gives, let him do it simply, and he that rules with diligence, and he that shows mercy, mercy do it with cheerfulness. These gifts are given. They're not earned. It's an act of grace. In the moment when they are given, if I don't obey, then grace is not fulfilling its purpose. And it's becoming empty or in vain. What does that mean? It means if I'm up here and I believe the Lord is sharing with me a word of knowledge and I don't give it or obey it properly, and the grace in that moment has become without purpose and in vain. I kept it to myself. It didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was minister to you. Does that make sense? If the Lord is speaking to me and he's wanting to prophesy over one of you or myself or over this church, and I don't give it, I am making grace vain. When Kendall had a picture and under the unction of the Holy Spirit, she doesn't give you that image or picture then in that moment, what was given to her is becoming in vain because she kept it to herself. She ate the seed. Does this make sense? So when the Lord tells you, for example, and this is, you know, uh, 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 and again, I'm, there's no manipulation here. I'm just giving an example because pastor used it. There's a wall that kids are falling off of in Honduras behind the church because it's in the mountains, right? And how far they fall in the parking lot? Four feet. Like four feet. Anyway, so they want to build the wall higher. You and I have the opportunity to sow into that, to build a wall higher so the kids can't get on it and fall and hurt themselves, right? That's an opportunity. If the Lord speaks to your heart to give and to sow into that, and you don't, then that grace is becoming in vain. It says, give, give simply. Do it. Be obedient. So these are ways, when these gifts are given, these are ways that we can allow grace to fulfill its purpose is we have to then use that gift, extend that gift. We have to minister, right? We have to prophesy. We have to... Uh, you know, show mercy. All these things. Have you ever disciplined? Oh, look, I can tie it into Mother's Day. It's great. Hey, moms, you ever disciplined your children and the Lord told you to show mercy and you went hard on them anyway? It's probably more a father thing anyway, I know. Because I have, and I've repented, and I've told the kids, you know, I'm sorry, and I apologize. Please forgive me. But when the Lord is telling me to show mercy and I don't, I'm being disobedient. First of all, that's sin. And number two, I made the grace in that moment, the gift given to show them mercy. I made it in vain by not showing them mercy. And so I believe this is what this is saying here. But there's another gift that a lot of times I don't think we think of. In 1 Corinthians 15, where we started at the end of the chapter, it says, 
or at the end of the, yeah, at the end of the chapter in verse 57, it says, but thanks, which is also the word for grace, be to God, which gives us, another variation of the word grace. By the way, this is coming out of, I told you I did a word study on grace. And I mean, this is how I found these scriptures. This is where I came to this, is spending months just looking at grace and the way that it was used. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's a gift. Victory is given. I don't earn victory. It's given. When I am tempted, the Bible says to go to Jesus to find grace in the time of need. It's that simple. And what am I going to do with that grace when I find it? When I find grace in this time of need. And the reason that we go to Jesus when we're tempted to find this grace to help us is because the Bible says it was in Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in all ways that we are. But yet it was without sin. That's why he's able to succor, S-U-C-C-O-R, it's in the Bible, it's, it's an old King James term, but it means to help us in our time of need. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that Jesus had every thought that you had that goes through your mind or, or was tempted to do everything that you've done in sin-wise, right? We understand that, correct? It means that the three main ways that their temptation comes, and we can see that Jesus debunked them all, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Jesus resisted all of these throughout his entire life. Therefore, we can go to him and resist them likewise. Every sin can be boiled down to that. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Which one? It's one of those categories. But when we go to Jesus to find grace in this time of need and for help, go back to Romans 6, so you don't have to, you put it on the screen, Here's what his grace helps us to do. Verse 12 of Romans chapter 6. His grace helps us to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. That we should obey its lust. I cannot let sin reign because of the grace of God. Of Jesus helping me to not let sin reign. It's a choice I have to make. The first choice I have to make is I have to go to Jesus. The second choice I have to make is receive his grace. And then, number three, not let it reign in my life. Verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. I can do that by the grace of Jesus when I go to him. But I can yield also by his grace myself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and my members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. I already read this. But the grace of God. When we go to God, this has been a prayer. Since I started reading and studying about grace, my prayer is, God, your grace is extended to me, but I don't know it. I don't know it like I'm reading it. Help me to know when your grace is upon me and give me the strength, Holy Spirit, to be obedient in that moment. Whether that is resisting temptation, whether that is ministry. Either way. Either way. Number three, the third way to fulfill the purpose of grace is by we just read it reigning in life through jesus we can reign in life through jesus by the grace of god romans chapter 5 i'm there already verses 15 through 17 and 20 through 21 romans chapter 5 15 says but i know i hate starting there but i'm going to anyway not as the offense so also is the free gift for if through the offense the sin of one the sin of adam that's what this means. If through the sin of Adam many are dead, much more the grace of God, the gift of by grace, by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. So he's saying, he's been doing this, he's been in this argument about Adam versus, the first Adam versus the last Adam, right? The Adam who sinned versus the one who never did. The last Adam being Jesus. He's saying that the sin of Adam... It killed us all. It did. We're born into sin. Therefore, since we were born into sin, the wages that we will receive from that sin is death and ultimately life without God. Now, there's an age of innocence. I'm not going to get into all of that uh, today. But what he's saying here is the gift of God, the grace that came to you, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many to undo this death, this sin that came through Adam. And not, verse 16, as it was by one that sinned, not by... Adam, you sin. The gift for the judgment by one to condemnation. That's what came through Adam. Condemnation, judgment. But the free gift of many sins of, from Jesus, our justification. And again, that word means to be made right with God. 
Verse 17. For if by Adam's offense death reigned, how much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Verse 20. Moreover, the law came in that the offense might be exposed and, and abound so we could see the sin. But where this sin overflowed, grace did much more overflow. That as sin reigned and brought death, even so might grace reign through being right unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me unpack that a little bit. I know the King James gets a little hard to read. It says, the grace of God and the gift by grace has abounded or overflowed to many through one man, that is Jesus Christ. And because of that, when we receive him in this way, we have an abundance of grace. In this word, in, in the definition for grace, in this word means we have an abundance of favor or delight from the Lord. That's what it means. And we have the gift of being right because he gave it to us. It's his gift alone to reign in life. This is why Jesus was given. This is the act of grace for us so we can reign in life now. I don't need to reign in life in heaven. There's no disease. There's no sickness, right? There's no murder, there's no deceitful ways. There's no crying. I mean, just go on and on and on. I need to reign in life now. This is why Jesus was given, and I can by the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness which was given to me. That's what this is saying here in Romans. The sin of Adam spread to everybody, but the obedience of Jesus brings us to right places with God, to being right in his presence. Where sin overflowed because the law exposed sin so that we knew what sin was, Grace much more abounded because Jesus came and grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no comparison between Adam's sin and the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace outweighs sin. Where sin increases, there is more than enough of the grace of God to triumph. That's what it's saying here. So here's the beauty of it. I don't know, I don't, I don't know, um, Kendall, if you want to go ahead and come on up, I'm almost done here. I, I was reading, I, I got to stop reading headlines on the way to church. It's bad, it's bad. I know this is a lot, this is doctrine, but here's the deal. If we just topically go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing constantly, if what you're going through in your life doesn't hit that topic you just heard at church, you might not stand. But if we have the ability to go through scripture by scripture by scripture, and you know God through the scripture, that will always stand. So last week we went through all of John chapter 6, or almost all of John chapter 6. This week we're starting to go through 1 Corinthians 15. Why? Because I want us to stand on the rock, the silent foundation of Jesus Christ. Because outside, people have gone nutso due to demonic influence. I read an article this morning, and this lady, this I don't want to say she's crazy, but she's been driven crazy through demonic influence. And I totally believe that's what it is. The devil has pushed this lady over the edge. It's screaming outside of a Catholic church, I kill babies, I kill babies, with a bunch of baby dolls in her hand. Why? Why is she doing this? As a show of support for abortion. Because the six judges, and it's not even six, by the way, because Roberts is as much liberal as any of the other ones. But the five judges are all Catholic in their faith. And so they're going to the houses of God to protest their decision. And this other protester at the same church is calling my father in heaven a woke daddy who killed his own son. That was on their placard that they're holding up. Here's the beauty of it. Where sin abounds, there's more than enough grace to triumph over that. Believe it or not, there is a way to reach these people. Now, there's a part where maybe they're hardened heart and you can't be reached. But you and I as Christians are not to make that decision and determination. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so when I look at how crazy the world is going over this, and, it, and again, it's all, it's, the, the devil's a liar. When the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, and I believe that they will, that doesn't, unfortunately, that doesn't make abortion illegal. If you want to be encouraged, I encourage you to type in Jeff Durbin. 
He's a pastor in Louisiana. And he runs the pro-life ministry there, like abortion no more. I don't remember what it's called. But he wrote an article. If you can find it, it is phenomenal. And he says it is a biological fact that all life begins at conception. Can't be disputed. You may argue the degree of viability. You may argue the degree of, of whether it can live or not. But it can't be disputed when life begins scientifically as a fact. Some people do, but you can't. And he says he's disappointed because he just is supporting a bill that is right now came out of committee in Louisiana to make abortion illegal and classify it as homicide. And I'm like, woohoo! Absolutely! He says in Louisiana right now, there's a law on the books that already exists that when Roe v. Wade is overturned, abortion will be illegal, and if it happens, doctors will be fined a thousand dollars. Yet in the same state of Louisiana, because of all their abundance of um, estuaries and whatever and wildlife, if you are cruel or take wrong to an animal, the fine is $25,000. And he says, this isn't good enough. And here's the sad thing. Here's what I want to encourage you with. Or maybe it's not encouragement, but here's where we need to stand. The biggest pushback he has against the bill that he's supporting, this pastor and his uh, uh, pro-life ministry, is that most Republicans in Louisiana are against it because they say it goes too far. Louisiana right to life, which we have an Indiana right to life, is one of the biggest opponents to him in this bill. That's an oxymoron. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. That is sin. And if you can find this article by him, he, he spells it out great in a scientific way. He spells it out great in a faith way. And he says, shouldn't this be the goal of every pro-life person in the world is to make abortion illegal? Now, by the way, that's not what we're overturning Roe v. Wade is going to do. It's going to go to the states. And then you and I have the right to press our state senators and our state representatives to make it illegal. Those of you who still support Amazon, you know they're paying for their employees to go to states to have abortions. It's called abortion tourism. If you can find another way to order stuff, do it. Does it cost you a couple extra bucks? Maybe. Maybe it does. Canada is passing a bill to pay for people to go into Canada to have abortions if it's outlawed in the United States. Guys, what I'm saying is very simple. Abortions existed forever. I'm reading of the first century right now, historically, they did abortions then. It's not new. The devil doesn't have new tricks. He doesn't have new ways. But wherever sin abounds, grace. Why? Because Jesus already came and he died. He's already offered his blood. He's already offered us victory. He's already offered us the cross, resurrection. He's already offered us a place seated in heaven in him. That doesn't change. It can't change and it will never change. Where sin increases is more enough of God's grace to triumph. It's one of the purposes of grace. So there's four. Or there's three. Here's the fourth one. We fulfill the purpose of grace when we preach the gospel of grace. I've been preaching that to you today. I preached it to you last week, even in the midst of John chapter 6. I preached it to you the week before when I, I spoke with you about God's grace. In Acts chapter 15, you'll have to turn there. It says this. This is Peter speaking in Acts 15. And when there had been much disputing, what's happening? Here's the problem. Gentiles, you and I, praise God, if you're not Jewish, are starting to get saved and those who are Jewish who grew up under the law, under the Mosaic law, they're trying to put some stipulations on the Gentile salvation. That's what, that's what they're arguing about. Paul is saying they're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. They need to do nothing else to be saved. And the Jewish Christians are saying, no, they still need to not eat food sacrificed to idols. They still need to not drink blood or, or eat uh, uh, food with the blood still in it. Not drink blood, that was wrong. You, you see what I'm saying? And Paul's saying, no, that's not right. And they're arguing, yes, this is what they need to do. Now, by the way, I don't want to eat anything sacrificed to idols. However, there's been missionaries not knowing it was, and they ate it. And the Bible says very clearly, you bless your food, and you sanctify your food, and it's holy to you. I don't live in fear. We don't have to live in fear of that. Does that make sense? Doc, it was Dr. Malone that had a good story about the poison in the soup, too. He had no idea what was in there. If I knowingly know it was sacrificed, I don't want to eat it. That turns my stomach. Okay, but we're not going to live in legalism over that. Does it make sense? But this is what they were trying to do, trying to put laws and, and trying to add to 
what, Jesus, what Paul was preaching, Christ and him crucified. Receive it, the grace of God. So that's where we're at in verse 7. Peter rose up and said to, to the other Jewish people there, Men and brethren, and they were Christians, you know how a good while ago God made the decision among us. God made the decision. That the Gentiles, by my mouth, this is Peter speaking, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Hear the gospel and believe the gospel. And God, who knows the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did us. And God did not put any difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. How did they get purified? Not by works of the law, by faith. Faith in what? Faith in what Peter was speaking of. Now, therefore, we, why do you tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor you and I were able to keep. This isn't Peter who denied Jesus Christ. This isn't Peter who wanted to go back fishing or follow Jesus from afar on the night that he was betrayed. This is bold Peter. This is Holy Ghost filled Peter. Verse 11, we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus, we shall be saved even as the Gentiles are. Then all the multitude got quiet, praise God, and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had done among the Gentiles by them. Peter says very clearly here, the Lord Jesus, the grace of him only is how we are saved, even as the Gentiles are saved. In order to fulfill grace, we must preach the gospel of grace. That's it. Not works. Not works. If somebody comes to you and they're excited because they believe Jesus Christ and you say, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. That, that feeling will go away. Calm down. Do this, 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 and this. Don't. That's wrong. Yes, you can mentor them and disciple them and lead them. I'm not saying that. But they don't have to do anything more to get saved except for believe in Christ and Christ crucified. And why do they have to calm down, by the way? Todd White says it like this. He says, when I was excited for God when I first got saved, everybody said, slow down, slow down. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Why? Why can't I sprint today, go to sleep, wake up and sprint tomorrow? Go to sleep, rest, wake up, sprint again. Why do we have to slow down? People get saved and they're excited about the Lord. They want to tell everybody about the Lord. They come into church, they put them to work, and they don't ever go outside and tell them about the Lord again because now they're serving in the church. Look, if you're not serving in the church, you're missing out. There's a blessing and a faithfulness and obedience that is honored through serving in your local body. There just is. But we're never not called to go out there. Ever. Always is that on our calling. That's grace. It's preaching the gospel of grace to those around us. Paul said that he was mandated by God in Acts 20 to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. In Acts 13, 43, the Jewish people that he was speaking to came to his side and said, please continue, please continue speaking to me about the grace of God. And if you go back in Acts 13, in verses 30, Paul was preaching, preaching about Jesus resurrecting from the dead. This is the gospel of grace. In verse 38, Paul was preaching the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. And in verse 39, he was saying, you are justified through what Jesus has done. That's it. It's the gospel of grace. We have eternal life through Christ Jesus because he raised from the dead. He died for our sins. Only he did that. We receive it by faith. And now we're right with God. Please stand with me. Grace came by Jesus when he came. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. I want to end with a story. And as I end with this story, the prayer team can go ahead and come on up. This story won't take very long. Two minutes. Two minutes. Here's the story. It's very simple. I think I might have shared it before, but it still applies today. The best way that we can waste grace or make it in vain is not receive it. And here's my illustration of that. Ready? There was a really rich man. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a name. It doesn't matter. There was a really rich man. And he had... A son, and it was customary in the family, because his, his whole family was rich, that when his sons graduated from uh, high school, they were given a car. And so him and his father, with the weeks leading up to 
the graduation, started going to different lots, looking at cars. And finally, the son settled on his car. It was beautiful. It had everything. It was everything he ever wanted. And he picked it out. And, and the father said, okay, son. He said, okay. Now, their life was like any teenage life, right, with a, with a father at the time. So when graduation came, he, got, he received a package very nicely wrapped. And it said his name on it. And he thought that was odd because that wasn't a car. And when he opened up the package, it was a Bible. And when it was the Bible, the son got mad and he got angry because he wanted the car. But see, the father had been reading and and praying and and he gave his life to the Lord and he wanted to leave him with something that was greater of value than a car would be of value. And his son was so mad, he didn't even open the Bible. He just pushed it on the table towards his father and he stormed out. He went to college, got married, and it had been like 12 years, never saw his father. He was so angry and bitter at what the father had done. All his cousins got cars. Where was his? He was so eaten with bitterness. And now that he's married, they're expecting to have their first child. And as he holds his baby for the very first time, he looks at him. He's pricked in his heart. And his wife says, you need to go see your father. They had gotten news about a month earlier that the father wasn't feeling very well. And so he got on a plane, and he's headed out to go see his father. And when he got there, and he knocked on the door, and he asked to see where his father was, he passed away a week earlier. And so he calls his wife and says, look, I hadn't talked to him in 12 years. He passed away, and I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to go through his things and help them situate it out. And as he was going through the things in his office, he found that Bible that his his father gave him on the day of graduation. You know, he just started to cry. So he starts to flip through the Bible. And as he flips through the Bible, the key falls out. It says, happy graduation, son. He goes into the garage, and there sits that car 12 years later. Never moved, never ran, never used. The best way that we make God's grace without purpose or empty or vain it's when we don't receive it. When we don't receive it. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you. God, I thank you for your grace. Jesus, I thank you that I don't have to work to get to salvation because if I did, I'd never make it. I thank you that it's a free gift offered by you, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Jesus, that now, after receiving you, you empower me. To live out a life of what you afforded through grace. I pray right now over those who are here in this congregation who are feeling condemnation or shame about their past, that they would be released from it right now in Jesus' name. That they would have a revelation of the grace of God through Jesus Christ who shed his blood that washes away, that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That they would receive the forgiveness of their sins, paid for, bought by. You, Jesus. I pray right now that there are those who you are speaking to, that you've given gifts to, and in that moment they would know that you are upon them, that you want to speak through them. They would yield themselves to release your grace to those around them, Lord Jesus. I pray that those who are struggling in in a miry pit, Lord Jesus, and, and in bondage today, that by your grace they would see that you've given us the victory through you, Jesus, and you, we can reign in life triumphing over sin and bondage. Lord Jesus, and, and, and negative thinking and, and those things that capture our attention, Lord Jesus, that aren't you. That we can come to you boldly to your throne of grace to receive help, grace, mercy in time of need, Lord God. And I pray a boldness come over us now to preach the gospel of grace to all we come into contact with, Father, in Jesus' name. We love you and we thank you. Amen.